In the early years of the 20th century, Americans began their intense love affair with the automobile. As early as 1912, a group called the National Organization of Automobilists set out to establish a transcontinental route between New York and Seattle. U.S. Highway 10 in North Dakota was a key component of that transcontinental route. Highway 10 ran through Bismarck, where there was no motor vehicle bridge crossing the Missouri River, only a time-consuming ferry during non-winter months. In fact, there wasn't a Missouri River bridge for vehicles in the entire state. In 1914, the onset of World War I made Europe a less than attractive vacation spot. Americans increasingly chose to spend their holidays driving their cars to U.S. destinations. Overnight, Highway 10 became a popular route for tourists passing through North Dakota. In 1919, more than 10,000 vehicles from outside the state passed through Bismarck and Mandan on Highway 10, crossing the river on that slow, laborious ferry. The increasing numbers of tourists bringing money into the state was just one factor creating the need for a Bismarck-Mandan bridge. Other factors included the rapidly growing state and local populations and the unforeseen popularity of the automobile. Suddenly, a bridge was a priority. In December of 1919, the state legislature passed funding to build the first bridge across the Missouri River in North Dakota. Choosing a location for the new bridge needed to take into account decisions that had been made more than 50 years earlier. The Minnesota consulting engineer firm belonging to Claude A.P. Turner, known as Cap Turner, was selected to design the new bridge. Turner was an American structural engineer who would eventually have 30 patents to his name. And even in the early 20th century, he had a number of distinct bridge designs from which to choose. North Dakota itself was home to a variety of bridge types. For instance, a suspension footbridge over the Cheyenne River in Valley City had been completed in 1901. The Highline Girder Railroad Bridge over the Cheyenne River in Valley City had been in place since 1908. Truss bridges were becoming popular, and North Dakota had several, including one built near Stanton in 1898 and another constructed near Dickey in 1914. An early reinforced concrete design called the Marsh Rainbow Arch Bridge was built in Mott in 1921, and another was constructed in Valley City in 1926. For the Missouri River Bridge's design, however, Turner chose to modify the Warren Truss, which had been patented in 1848 by its inventor, British engineer James Warren. A Warren Truss bridge uses only diagonal members. Turner's design added short vertical members to strengthen the diagonal members and reduce the amount of steel needed. Turner believed that this modification would reduce construction time and costs. He eventually received a patent for his new design, the Warren Turner Truss. The Liberty Memorial Bridge is one of only two known Warren Turner Truss bridges ever built. The other, constructed in 1925, is in Puyallup, Washington. Work on the Missouri River Bridge began in June of 1920. It was a daunting project, given the width and unpredictability of the Missouri River and the weather and temperature extremes in the region. Just as Turner had claimed for his design, the bridge trusses were built with unprecedented speed. In August of 1922, after two years of construction, the bridge over the Missouri River between Bismarck and Mandan was opened. It was not only the first highway bridge over the Missouri in North Dakota, but also the final link on the new transcontinental highway between New York and Seattle that had been envisioned in 1912. Its importance was far-reaching as it provided a vital connection within the state by helping support the economies of western and eastern North Dakota by boosting agriculture and tourism. The 2,548-foot-long bridge was 27 and a half feet wide and had six-foot sidewalks. The bridge was dedicated to honor North Dakota soldiers in World War I and was christened the Liberty Memorial Bridge. More than 12,000 people attended a three-day dedication extravaganza in Bismarck and Mandan, featuring parades, dances, and a pageant. Two years later, the North Dakota chapter of the American War Mothers donated bronze memorials that were placed at each end of the bridge to honor fallen soldiers. 
Over the decades, the Liberty Memorial Bridge received periodic improvements. Near the end of the 20th century, however, the fixes simply couldn't keep pace with the changes taking place in the Bismarck Mandan area and the automotive industry. One of the biggest changes was in the population. U.S. population grew from 110 million in 1922 to more than 308 million in the year 2010. The Bismarck-Mandan metropolitan area population increased from about 11,000 in 1922 to nearly 111,000 residents in the year 2011. Another large change was in the number of vehicles on the roads. In 1924, just two years after the first Liberty Memorial Bridge was completed, the average traffic count over the bridge was 2,200 vehicles a day, and by 2009, just over 11,200 vehicles traveled over the bridge every day. Changes in vehicle width and weight also added to the problem. In the 1920s, vehicles and driving lanes were much narrower than they are today. These were the population, transportation, and vehicle changes over 80 years. What hadn't changed were the extremes of North Dakota weather, frigid winters, and blistering summers. And in the 20s, there was nothing even remotely like the modern tractor-trailer combinations that travel North Dakota highways with an ever-increasing load limit. The normal bridge wear and tear from sand and salt during the winter, and the rust that is inevitable on any steel structure. Considering all these factors, Cap Turner accomplished something extraordinary when he built a bridge that served its purpose for more than eight decades. Not only did the bridge connect the communities of Bismarck and Mandan, it also served as a historic landmark for many decades. For 86 years, the Liberty Memorial Bridge had done its job well but its decades of usefulness were coming to an end. There were several years of passionate public discussion regarding the bridge. The public understood that the existing bridge, as it stood, could not safely be used much longer. But many Bismarck and Mandan residents had a deep affection for the bridge. It had been a part of the river skyline for as long as they could remember. Many residents hoped that engineers could find a way to rehabilitate the existing bridge so that it could continue to be used into the future. She was a grand old lady, that old bridge. My real recollection of the bridge was driving on the metal grate, and I think a lot of people really liked that. You know, it gave a, a nice humming sound, and if you weren't driving, you could look out the window and look down and see the water down there. It was often called the singing bridge because of the unique singing sound it made as tires crossed over the steel grates, which in later years were replaced with concrete. The time had come, however, to consider current and future transportation needs. I remember being a third grader when my dad and I drove over that bridge. We went to New Salem from Zeeland, North Dakota and, and bought some coal for our furnace. My dad took me out of school so that I could travel with him and keep him awake and alert on this long trip with, with a truck. And I'll never forget how scared I was going over that bridge. The fact that you're sitting in a truck, you're sitting up high, and, and I'm just a, a kid who had never seen anything like that. Other residents had less nostalgia about the old bridge and were ready for a safe new bridge that looked completely different. First of all, the existing bridge was a historic bridge. It was over 50 years old, which makes it historic. From that perspective, what we had to do is make sure that the purpose and need of replacing the existing bridge was adequate to... Uh, actually take the bridge down. And there was a, quite a large group that was concerned about taking the bridge down. And what they wanted to do was, if at all possible, to preserve the bridge. The Department of Transportation, along with its consultant engineers, did quite an analysis to determine whether or not we could save that bridge because it was historic and basically just uh, renovate it. What we learned from our documentation, from our inspections, was that pack rust had taken over and the bridge was not going to be salvageable. Pack rust is, a, is rust that compacts itself between two steel members and really basically swells the steel and ultimately it'll pop the rivets. And so it was just not possible to save the bridge. 
In addition, over the years, numerous repairs had been made to the bridge's piers, and since the long-term health of the bridge was in question, the best option was to construct a new bridge to carry traffic for many more decades. The old bridge was part of Bismarck Mandan's social, recreational, and transportation history, and the new bridge needed to fill the same role for future generations. It needed to be affordable, safe, functional, and beautiful. In 2004, the North Dakota Department of Transportation formed a Citizens Advisory Committee to help gather public input on how the new bridge should look. Members included representatives from state and city agencies, the Chamber of Commerce, any interested members of the public at large, and, of course, the veterans' organizations. Engineers considered what it would take to bring the existing bridge up to current safety and capacity standards. The results of their study showed that the bridge's lanes were too narrow for modern vehicles, and there were not enough lanes to meet existing and future traffic needs. It became clear that the best thing to do would be to construct a brand new bridge that would meet projected transportation needs for the next 80 years or so. Francis Ziegler got us involved very early in the design of the bridge when they had the community meetings. He invited the veterans organizations to be there, and we did show up and we did have input at that time. The, um, we were asked about the flags that were going to be put up on the bridge, which flags would be flown, and the overlooks, the design of the overlooks and all that. So we got uh, involved fairly early in the design when it came to the overlooks and the plazas on the end. That was the veterans' input. The Department of Transportation also formed a technical advisory committee composed of engineers and architects from its own staff, the Federal Highway Administration, the cities of Bismarck and Mandan, and various consultant firms. The committee discussed the design options and, using the Citizens Advisory Committee recommendations, created a final design decision document. We had to get the cities of Bismarck and Mandan, along with the historic community, together to discuss how we could mitigate the historic aspects of this bridge. The way we did that was through a context-sensitive design system. And the idea is that we all sit down as a group we look at different aspects of, of the look of the bridge and to see how we can integrate the historic aspects into the bridge. Uh, as, as, as we came together as a group, what happened was that everybody got their little blue dots, their little voting dots, and then we looked at different styles of the bridge, different configurations of the bridge, and people actually kind of voted on what they liked best. Each image was uh, interpreted for them so that they could see how it was going to collect, number one, the historic aspects of it, and number two, to be setting itself up as a landmark bridge. The committee made several major recommendations. One was that the new bridge should include features that would perpetuate its status as a memorial to veterans. They also recommended that the bridge be a long-span, high-profile structure. Long span means there's a long distance between bridge piers, the foundational supports that hold up the bridge. High profile means that the pier should be tall so that the bridge is high above the water. These two recommendations meant that the river and scenery would be highly visible and also that boats would be easily able to pass under the bridge. And so with that, uh, after the voting was finished, uh, we tallied the votes and um, put together the designs and showed the final design to those three groups and uh, they were very happy with it. In fact, one of the comments that I heard from one of the veterans was that as you take a look at the bridge now, it has the columns that have a V in them. His comment was that we've already had victory in this bridge because the columns look like a V. So he was very happy with, with that aspect of it, the veterans and the V stood out in his mind. So it was a very interesting concept, very interesting concept to pull it all together. One of the key things with the success of our communication was the fact that we were always open, open to having input or taking input and open to people's ideas. We tried to have a very transparent image of what was happening. So what we did was we made sure that we had a, number one, a good rapport with the media. We always had invited the media to come to the meetings and so that they could see what we were doing. We were very transparent with everything that was done. And that paid off. It paid off from the standpoint 
when we got finished with the whole process and with the bridge, I would get many comments to say, you know, I really feel like this is part of the community now because I had a say in it. The steel bridge designed by the NDDOT was selected and construction began in the summer of 2007. Crews ready the new memorial bridge site just south of the current bridge. Workers started constructing coffer dams, driving in steel piling, and building the first of many piers over the next few months. The weather during the winter of 2007 seemed bent on freezing the bridge work to a halt. Day after day saw temperatures of minus 20 and lower, but thanks to the hardy perseverance of the crews, work stopped for only one day that winter. You have to design coffer dams that are quite deep into the river, and you had to account for fluctuations in the river elevations, you know, because uh, we have Garrison Dam up north, so whatever they do affects what we do down here, and they had that challenge. And that, of course, includes barges, cranes on barges, getting the concrete out into the river. So you have a lot of different uh, challenges when you're, when you're across the river. During the construction period, the DOT placed cameras on both sides of the bridge with a video feed so the public could watch the bridge construction in real time as it happened. The fact that people could sit at home on their computer, not have to be in the Hardhead area, but actually be able to watch this bridge being built and uh, take it all in. And so they, again, felt very much a part of the bridge as it was uh, being completed. After just over two years of construction, the new Liberty Memorial Bridge opened to traffic in August of 2008. The new bridge was designed with both vehicular and water traffic in mind. The four-lane, 2,369-foot-long steel box girder bridge looks nothing like its predecessor. Architecture played a large part in the design and construction of the bridge. The large block structures give a visual clue to the transition from concrete approach bridges to the main steel bridge. Uh, the gang forms were assembled offshore. You set up your back wall, and that had the shape of one side of the pier already attached to the back wall. Then you enclose your sides, and then you take the other side of the pier, which had this specially designed form inside of it, and you clamp it together. In a steel box girder bridge, the main beams, or girders, the units running the length of the bridge to support it, are made of steel formed into a long, hollow box. The new bridge has two 34-foot roadways and a 10-foot wide multi-use path. The parks, which were dedicated in May of 2011, also include interpretive panels explaining the first bridge's history, technical details, and role in the expansion of Bismarck Mandan and the surrounding area. Light deflectors are incorporated to soften the lights that reflect on the military symbols and flags. At night, the lighting provides a reflection off of the river while illuminating the piers, walkways, flags, and spires, creating a pleasant ambiance that defines the bridge and the cityscape it stretches across. The bronze memorials that were placed at the ends of the first bridge in 1924 by the North Dakota chapter of the American War Mothers have also found a home in the bridge's parks. At each end of the bridge, a plaza features flagpoles and soaring white spires, representing the signing of the Armistice of 1918, ending World War I on the Western Front. Armistice Day eventually became Veterans Day in the U.S. Uh, underneath on each end, there's a plaza under there, too. The spirals you see on the east and west end, there's 11 of them for the 11th hour, 11th day, 11th month in 1918, when the Armistice was signed. That's what those pillars are for there. The bridge has five pedestrian overlooks, each representing veterans and fallen soldiers of a branch of the U.S. military, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Coast Guard. In keeping with tradition, the U.S. flag, POW MIA flag, and the North Dakota flag are flown over the bridge during certain holidays. We called all the veterans organizations together and decided what days they wanted to fly those flags and they decided on five of them, Veterans Day, Memorial Day, uh, President's Day, the 4th of July, and Flag Day. Those are for sure we fly them on that day. Uh, the other days we fly them is at the direction of the governor, or if there's a national call to fly the flags, we put them up. Although the original bridge's recognizable trusses no longer decorate the Bismarck Mandan skyline, its legacy continues as a unifier of North Dakota and a memorial to the men and women of the armed services. 
On October 6th, hundreds of people lined the banks of the Missouri to watch the demolition of the first section of the Liberty Memorial Bridge. A total of 198 charges and 43 pounds of explosives were used to drop the west span of the bridge into the river below. Shortly after the implosion, cranes and barges were used to remove the sections from the main river channel and crews readied the site for the next phase. Then, on October 29th, the final phase of the bridge demolition was completed when the last two spans were brought down with 100 pounds of charges. Once complete, crews took to the task of removing about 22,000 tons of steel from the chilly waters of the Missouri. As far as the old bridge, a lot of people missed that. It went fairly well overall as far as demolition. It's, it's sad to see it go. It's well documented. The challenge was getting it out of the river, uh, but it, it's from what my, my experience is, you know, the demolition of the old bridge is fairly typical of how they do that. They normally shear it in pieces and then take the pieces out so they can, you know, get them sized to be hauled out on semis because uh, there's nowhere else for it to go. Uh, I know um, there's people that got their souvenirs off the bridge, if you will, what they could, but most of it was salvaged and scrapped and recycled as steel. The concrete was hauled to a nearby site crushed and will be used, I'm sure, as some base somewhere. So it was all, you know, reused somewhere. The new bridge is a story about people, the people who serve our country, provide military service, and also about the people of Bismarck and Mandan who work together to provide a structure built with tradition, vision, and honor. The department recognized the importance of retaining the historical aspect of the bridge by embracing a design reflective of the area and the community. The new bridge was dedicated on Veterans Day, November 11, 2008, amid a parade of military units. Did the new bridge meet our expectations? I think it exceeded our expectations because you can see it on a set of plans, the drawings, you know, when it's a flat plain view and you look at that and you say, yeah, that plaza looks nice or that overlook looks nice on there. But until you actually see it under construction and it starts taking place and it, it has a life of its own once, it's, so to speak, once it gets built and you actually step onto that overlook and then raise those flags up there and then you realize what it was all about. A program featuring a wreath ceremony, a rifle volley and the playing of taps is held on the new bridge each Memorial Day to honor our fallen veterans who have so bravely served our country. Because the first Liberty Memorial Bridge was such an important part of state and local history, many entities have taken steps to preserve its story. The North Dakota Department of Transportation Cultural Resources Section, along with the State Historical Society, researched the bridge's history and archived old photographs. The Historical Society uses this information in a traveling exhibit on truss bridges. The new Liberty Memorial Bridge plays a key role in supporting the growing economic needs of the business industry and traveling public throughout the country. Detailed documentation on the bridge has been completed and added to the Historic American Engineering Record, available through the Library of Congress.
The parks and plazas at the ends of the bridge help to document the bridge's history. Both the old and new bridges are included in a beautiful full-color book on the historic and memorable bridges of North Dakota, published by the State Department of Transportation. Finally, this documentary itself is part of the state's plan to communicate the historic importance of these two bridges. The history of the bridges reflects the history of North Dakota and of Bismarck and Mandan during the 20th century. The bridges also reflect the people of our state. Here in North Dakota, when we see what needs to be done, we do it. The NDDOT's mission is accomplished by communities and agencies working together to build bridges and highways to safely move people and goods.